What's up, wildcard roomies? I'm Quackers Co., and this is the fish fry for December 2nd, being held at Marooner's Bay. The cooking utensils for this rotation are the first things that we pick up from the drawer, so this episode will mainly cover Marooner's Bay. However, we have three new cooking utensils in the drawer. So first I'd like to cover these three new tools. The first utensil we're looking at is the Big Swig Roller. The Big Swig does not have enough damage with its roll to splat chum, but its flick is wider than any other roller in the game. And this roller also has a unique ability in that it can bounce lessers when you roll into them. So using the technique of flicking a couple times above the heads of your enemies and then rolling into them works pretty well. You can also use this bump to line up all the chum, use that flick to cause some real big damage, and take out that horde pretty quickly. Its fling's range is also up there with the fling's a roller. So if you're dealing with a long train of enemies, you can use that same technique, fling above the heads of the enemies, and have that ink damage that train of lessers. And then start rolling into them, line them up, and then splat them. Its decreased damage output makes it a little bit harder to take out some bosses. So make sure you use this tool where it has its strengths. It can fill up a flipper flopper spot in a quick roll or just a couple flicks. It's also a fantastic tool for taking out fish sticks. And on Marooner's Bay, you won't have too much of a height advantage against them. So make sure you climb on top of them and take them out in just a couple flicks. The big swig seems like it might be a little bit weak for Salmon Run, but once you get this thing going, it can cause some crazy damage. And on a Glowflies Wave, that roll should be pretty helpful in order to keep those lessers back so that your teammates can hold that damage line. And Marooner's Bay has a fantastic glowfly spot. If you stand at the edge of the right Great Bridge, it'll funnel all the lessers into one lane, making it easy to hold that line and push it forward when you need to go collect those eggs. It also doesn't hurt just to flick this weapon as well. It can cause some really good damage, you just gotta be kinda smart about how you use it. Our second newest cooking utensil in the drawer is the Splattershot Nova. The Splattershot Nova has an increased range in comparison to the Splattershot. It does have a lower damage output, but one thing that it kept with the Splattershot is its ability to paint walls. This thing does an even better job at painting walls than it does at painting the turf. And considering there aren't that many walls at Marooner's Bay, it should be pretty easy to take this weapon and get those walls painted. If someone's focusing on the aft end of the ship, get over there to those elevators, rise them up, and start painting the sides of them. There's probably going to be a moment where we're going to need them. And since this weapon has that lower damage output, keep that in mind whenever you're using it. You can easily toss a bomb into that horde, get a little bit of your ink back, and then start laying down that damage. So when you have the Splattershot Nova, it's helpful to play it a little bit more defensively, almost more like the Jet Squelcher or a Splattershot Pro that has some ink efficiency. Keep that ink topped off, and it'll be easy to take out some of those priority targets like Flyfish and Stingers. Its range is also fantastic for taking out fish sticks from the ground floor here at Marooner's Bay. Both the Nova and the Big Swig Roller are fantastic small fry control tools when you're on a griller's wave. Our last new cooking utensil in the drawer is the Snipe Rider 5H. The Snipe Rider takes almost exactly three seconds to charge up. And once it's fully charged, it has five shots that it can fire. And these shots are fired whenever you let go of the trigger. It's helpful to hold onto that trigger. That way, whenever you get your shot lined up, all you have to do is let go. It gives you less deviations to your aim, keeping your shots a little bit more on target. And this utensil does not hold its charge when you're swimming. This utensil can tap shot small fry, and a quarter charge does a good job at taking out chum. But considering how much more damage output you can have with this weapon, always try to get yourself back to a full charge. Try to not leave too much time in between you having a full charge and waiting for your target. You need to play the Snipe Rider super duper strategically. The amount of time it takes for you to fire those last two shots and swim to the next location is about the same amount of time it takes for you to charge up all five shots. So instead of waiting to fire those last two shots, get it to where it needs to be, charge it up, and release that damage. It doesn't hurt to use that first charge in the shot to give yourself a little bit of mobility or an exit strategy. You can't play the Snipe Rider as aggressively as the Bamboozler, but this weapon does have some extra range and mobility that the Bamboozler does not. Its shot does not pierce, and if you're ever using tap shots, make sure that you're using them very strategically to take out fish sticks or to take out some small fry that are creeping up on you. And just like with the Bamboozler, put some of that damage that you have onto Cohawks. That way it's easier for all your teammates to lay that damage out and help keep Marooner's Bay clear. This map is almost as small as Gone Fission and just about as dangerous. All right, let's talk about Marooner's Bay. Just like every Salmon Run map, there are three main locations that Salmon had spawned from. The port side of the ship, which I will call the docks, the starboard side of the ship, which I will call the beach, and the aft end of the ship, which I will call the walls. 
Another reason that this map is very similar to Gone Fission is how dangerous those shoreline spawn locations are. Like every single map, we need to lure Salmonids to the basket to make it easier to collect eggs. Marina's Bay does let you throw eggs into the basket from the docks and the beach shorelines. But we need to remember that ink is a resource. It might be better to just toss a couple eggs and then run that last one in. Get your ink back and it'll be easier to get around this map. One very unique feature of Marina's Bay are the elevators on these sides. And these elevators have paintable walls. So one of the best wall paint strategies you can do with Marooner's Bay is really based on the composition. The best wall painting weapon should easily go to the aft end of the ship and focus on the walls. And it's best to get all the way around all the corners, that way you don't have to use the ramps. As we know, the ramps are for the salmonids. We swim through walls, not ramps. Other utensils that don't have such good wall painting, like rollers or chargers, should go activate those elevators and then paint the sides of them. There's going to be moments where we don't see that a teammate is wanting to get on that elevator and we're going to leave them behind. We might as well give them that exit strategy before they need to give themselves that exit strategy. And with such a few amount of walls, it's pretty easy to get this map painted. The left two fingers of the dock spawning location can be jumped in between. And that longer finger has a low wall. That way if you need to, you can lure salmonids into another location, potentially giving yourself a little bit of an opening and an exit strategy. All of the mobility on the aft end walls of the ship are in the walls. So make sure you paint everything you can. There's going to be moments where the horde is just a little bit too big, and those walls are the only way that we can get around. And since flyfish love to spawn on this area, once we have these walls painted, we have a little bit of space to wall hang and give ourselves a little bit of extra ink to toss those bombs. The beach spawning location is easily the most dangerous. This area has almost no movement options. And considering that section in the middle of the ship is open, once you're down there, salmonids will start to flow from almost all directions. So if you ever go down to this area to take out a shoreline target, or to collect some eggs, you need to get back up as quick as possible. It's easy to stun almost everything down there, and you will never be able to get back. Even these little boxes can't be jumped over, there's just nothing you can do when you get out here. But one interesting thing about this location, you can jump to it from the front of the ship. So this location can be used very strategically as an exit strategy. But like I said before, as soon as you get down there, you need to get on the elevator and get up very quickly. And don't forget, if you find yourself falling into that bottom level corridor in the middle of the ship, you can now throw an egg from there. Don't forget to clutch that match for your teammates. One thing that's going to make Marooner's Bay more difficult than Gone Fission is the location of the basket. In Gone Fission, it was in the center. To get to the basket at Marooner's Bay, we may have to swim by all the ship, and the fish stick locations will completely cut our mobility. So fish sticks on Marooner's Bay are a very high priority target. The fish sticks will also give us fantastic locations to throw bombs in for fly fish. Marooner's Bay can be played insanely smart. Look for those moments where you can cut corners, climb walls, and get eggs in or closer to the basket. On a high tide, things become insanely tight here. With flyfish still spawning by the walls, we need to cut through all of the madness in order to get to them. So at this point, we need to make sure at the beginning of a high tide wave that all of those walls are painted. It's easy to find ourselves getting bumped off onto that lower portion of the ship, and that back section wall can easily be an escape strategy instead of having to go through all the madness. Don't forget you can spam the jump button when you're swimming up a wall to speed up your swimming speed. Because this ship is on an incline, if ever we're tossing eggs, they might not go as far as you think. So remember, your ink is a resource. It might be easier to run that egg and throw a bomb behind you on your way there. Just like the high tide in Marooner's Bay, low tide is also really, really tight. And you need to be careful about jumping into the water right whenever you see that low tide notification. It's easy to jump yourself into the water and not have as much time to paint the turf as you'd like to. The shape of this low tide is also pretty unique. There's a ring sandbar and a sandbar peninsula. Just like most low tides, there's some little corners that we can cut here. And if you have a long range weapon, you can reach some targets on these other shorelines. And since we need to reach flyfish and stingers, it's easy to find yourself overextending and getting bounced into the water. So one thing to note about this low tide is all of the spawning locations are on the outside rim of the ring and the peninsula. So as long as you ride the inside of the curve, you can actually get yourself all the way around the ring in order to revive someone or to toss a bomb into a flyfish. It's also really helpful to find out if a steel eel is targeting you, and you can keep him away from the basket for just a little bit of extra time. Giving your teammates a chance to clear out that basket area, that way you can lead the steel eel and let them take it out too. Giving yourself plenty of eggs. With this low tide being so tight, sometimes it doesn't hurt to retreat. But whenever you retreat, you're not outputting that damage. But one really great thing to know, if you're holding onto that quota egg and you're retreating, you can throw an egg from the front of the ship into the low tide basket. Marooner's Bay is one of the most difficult maps, so don't feel bad if it takes a while to get used to it. 
And if you play this map in Splatoon 2, try to remember, we've got more movement options and we can throw eggs. Play this map like it's fresh and expect things to get just a little bit crazy. As mentioned before, during a Glowfly's occurrence, as long as you stay there at the beginning edge at the right side Great Bridge, it should be easy to funnel all those enemies together and deal that damage. That platform in the middle just after the Great Bridges is a fantastic spot for a Driller's Wave. You just need to make sure that you lure them into that area right in front of it. If you lure them into the basket, it's going to be really hard to hit your shots and you might find yourself overrun by Small Fry. Just like always with Mudmouth Waves, know what weapon works well against the lessers that are spawning and take out Golden Mudmouths as quick as possible. Keep less enemies on the map and more eggs spawning. This map is just like every other map on a Mothership Wave. There are Chinooks that will get there right by the basket, so be careful about how many eggs you're tossing because there's probably going to be some enemies or some golden eggs that you can collect there by the basket. During a Goldie Seek, one thing that I was not able to test is if the Big Swig Roller Bounce works against the Goldie. So always try to make sure that you deal that damage and keep an eye out for where those lessers are spawning. During a Golden Tornado Wave, there's a lot of ways that we can get these eggs to the basket. It still wouldn't hurt to either throw the eggs on the beachside elevator, or you might need to have someone there at the top of the ship in order to put those eggs in. During an extra wave, we need to know how much DPS our weapon can deal and where our damage should be dealt. I'll put a link in the description to show off the DPS of all the weapons that we have. If you have a higher DPS weapon, you should probably focus your damage on the Kohozuna, only breaking away to get your ink and to maybe grab some eggs. You also need to try to stay a little bit topped off on ink, just in case a Maw shows up. The higher DPS weapons usually have a shorter range to them as well, so these weapons can do a great job on aggroing the Kohozuna and keeping him in the center of the map, making it easier for everyone to reach him with their egg cannons. When you have a weapon with a lower DPS, but it can deal a good amount of damage with its shots, focus on bosses and dealing some damage to lessers. Make it easier to take out these enemies. If you have a weapon that has really good ink efficiency, try to keep yourself topped off, that way you can deal with Flyfish. Extra waves will always do better as long as everyone is causing damage to the Kohozuna whilst also dealing damage to everything that's spawning. And that egg cannon doesn't use ink to use. So if there's a big pool of eggs, try to make sure that you use that egg throw and a little bit of damage to lure that Kohozuna away from those eggs. Once he then jumps, you can then collect those eggs and start to release that damage. And as I say with every extra wave, look for that moment right towards the beginning of the wave where you can use your special to not just cause some damage to the Kohozuna, but to also take out some bosses, spawning some golden eggs early on in the wave. And the fish fry usually comes up before the stage rotation. So if you want to catch these updates when they're hot and fresh, make sure you subscribe and hit that bell. And if you want other fellow Grisco employees to receive these tips, make sure you like and share the video. Bye bye To give the fish fry an algorithm boost, just let me know which of the new weapons is your favorite. My favorite is going to have to be the Splattershot Nova. I love painting walls, and this utensil does a fantastic job at it. Alright, bye bye